<laughs> okay. So now we'll start. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our last panel for today um, for our genocide awareness and prevention discussion um, as part of the Human Rights Symposium. My name is Adana Alic, and I will be moderating this discussion. Um, on July 11th, 1995, the world stood silent while 8,372 Bushnok men and boys were systematically murdered in the Bosnian town of Srebrenica. 25 years later, many Bosnians deal with the aftermath of the genocide. Many have still not recovered their loved ones while survivors battle with the trauma. And as a whole, we are consistently combating genocide denial. This discussion today is inspiration from the success of the Academy nominated film Kova de Shaida which um, the attendees can also still stream until tonight on our website, the Human Rights and Symposium. The film humanizes and puts faces and stories to the genocide that happened in Srebrenica. In a way, it also provides a method and a platform to remember the genocide. Our conversation today will include representatives from various organizations whose goals are based on genocide education, remembrance, memorial services, and essentially genocide awareness through their efforts of discussing the severance of genocide. Today, uh, we have Tatiana Milanovic, um, Milovanovic, <laughs> um, as, sorry, <laughs> um, as she is the director of the, um, she is the director of the Post-Conflict Research Center um, we have da Dr. David Pettigrew, um, stepping in for Ida Sefer. Um, he is the secretary of the board um, for the Bosnia American Genocide Institute. And we have Arnesa Bulishmich Kustura, is the deputy director for the Remembering Serbita, um, UK based organization. Um, we were supposed to have Dr. Emmett Tulagic, but sadly something has come up and we can't have him here today. But I still expect um, to have a great conversation and discussion. Um, at our end. So, to start off, I, um, I guess to go straight into it is um, how, what's the most effective way in remembering genocide, and especially with Srebrenica. And then all of you guys are part of organizations that um, really make an effort to remember the gen genocide and remember um, the survivors and put their um, faces and their um, stories out there. So, what do you think is the most effective way in reaching out to people and spreading this awareness. And we can start, whoever wants to start first, go ahead. Sure, I can uh, start it off. Um, I think right now what we are, we're sort of in this moment of, you know, social media being this huge catalyst for uh, impactful change, raising awareness, education of all, all sorts. And it's kind of across the board, obviously. You know, you have your Twitter, your Facebook, your TikTok now, which is this huge thing. Um, so in comparison to, I would say, 10 years ago, where I often felt, I think it was just me and, you know, other Bosnians and other survivors who were kind of screaming into the void about what had happened in Srebrenica and Sarajevo, all uh, in Visegrad and Prijedor, all throughout, you know, Bosnia, and not really being heard as much. Now we have this amazing sort of opportunity to actually educate on the genocide. Um, and we can do, do that through the tools, obviously, of social media. Um, and that doesn't have to be just through, you know, nonprofit and charitable organizations such as Remembering Srebrenica or the Post Conflict Research Center or the Bosnia Genocide Institute. It can be on an individual basis. Um, and I think, you know, from just my own personal experience, it is. There's so many different ways to remember and to educate, but I think right now, 1 of our most powerful tools, um, which have also provided a really a voice to what people uh, tragically often describe as the voiceless, which, in my opinion, they are not. Uh, they are just often the ignored. Um, but social media is really where it kind of is is going to start. You have articles, you have webinars, you have, you know, movies, films, uh, everything in, in 
art, creative works, all of those things. Um, but people really, really pay attention to the personal side of, of things, to the actual personal survivor stories. I mean, obviously, as somebody with an academic background, I can tell you the very huge difference as somebody who speaks on the genocide in a sort of academic or uh, a professional setting. Um, the response to that is much different than when I am sharing my own personal story or the story of somebody I knew and I loved. Um, so I think, you know, utilizing survivor voices and really amplifying them on social media right now is one of the absolute best ways to really push that awareness and remembrance. Thank you, maybe then I can go. Um, thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I do say tonight because it's uh, in Bosnian time a bit after 10 p.m. Um, yeah, so no, in, 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 in the work with of, of a post-conflict research center, there are a couple of things that we advocate for um, when it comes to um, ensuring remembrance, yes, but uh, also in, in, within that, um, ensuring prevention of, of conflict and ensuring genocide prevention. Um, one of the, for us, primary ways and, and ways, ways that we always come back to, um, that we have to come back to, um, is, is, is legal protection, is first and foremost um, criminalization of, of genocide denial, criminalization of hate speech. Um, as you probably know, we, we still have not been able to, um, uh, we still don't have a, a law that prevents um, genocide denial. Um, and then on top of that, um, even, even though we do have a lot of, and a lot of work has been done on the judicial side and legal side on prosecutions, uh, even though that, that, type of, that, that type of work is still not done yet, um, but that might be one of the, that, that for us is one of the first ways. Um, next to it and kind of not next to it, yeah, not, not after it, but right, right next to it um, is education. Um, it's, it's something that our center has been doing um, for for years now. Is, is first and foremost education on facts, on historical facts, on what what has happened um, in relation to Srebrenica genocide, especially. Um, and we find education as a way of, of one of the best ways uh, to prevent genocide denial and to work with uh, with our community on preventing conflict. Um, when I say education, I don't necessarily always just mean educating about historical facts. Um, we in our center try to go further. Um, it's also educating just about peace and, and what does it mean to, pre to prevent it? Why do we need to guard it? Um, you know, some, some 10 years ago when we started this work and we started talking about genocide prevention to people in Bosnia, everyone told us, what, what do you mean? What do we need to prevent? What's happening? And then in the last, um, in, in these last 10 years, we, we've seen a big raise in, in, in hate speech in, in um, attempts to, to uh, rewrite the history, to, to delete uh, the numbers and delete the victims and delete their voices. Um, and now, yeah, thankfully now, the, even the international community is understanding this more seriously um, and, and, and seeing why we do need to talk um, about peace, what it means for our communities, um, how can all of us guard it and why do we even need it? Um, and then maybe as a, as a third thing here um it's truly really that all of these activities i'm speaking from from the side of, of civil society organizations um and there's a lot of, of of my colleagues have been doing this uh way longer than me since the 90s when i was just born um but for for all of this type of work um to be more functionally more, to, to 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 come with more functional cooperation and, and a unique and a kind of unified voice um, and that kind of comes from the side of civil society as well. There's a lot of different activities, sometimes even multiplied. Um, but what we're trying to do as a center as well is to bring all those voices together so that we can make a, a, a more a, a kind of a more long lasting change and have a more powerful voice. We've done this through different activities. We do have now a um, coalition of, of civil society organizations in the Western Balkans, which is the Western Balkan Coalition for Genocide Prevention. Um, it has about 30 leading civil society organizations um, from, from the Balkans, all doing this type of work, doing it in their own spheres and their own cities. Um, and through this coalition, we're trying to come up with this unified voice. 
Um, and just to finish off, because I do, do tend to talk a lot, um, also understanding that when it comes to conflict, conflict and genocide prevention, um, it is a long-term process. It never stops. Um, it, it started in 1995 when, when the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed, or it should have started, um, and it will continue throughout our history. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that we've also been struggling with as a, as a grassroots civil society organization in, in pushing these efforts and trying to make people understand that this type of work will never end. Um, it will just transform, um, you know, in 20, 50 years, we will, we will remember um, the same events. We will just maybe remember them through different means. And as I was saying, social media, all these new medias that we have around us, but we will still do it with the same goal. So it's definitely a, a long-term, long-term commitment. Um, and, and that also needs sustainable support from, from all sides. Thank you. I, I just add uh, briefly to that. I say th thank you for uh, inviting uh, the Bagi Bosnian American Genocide Institute to participate, and uh, I'm uh, glad to be able to participate. Sorry that Ida can't can't uh, join us. Uh, I, I would just echo what uh, Arnesa and Tatiana were saying that um, first in a, uh, in, a, in a in a post. A genocide society and responding to genocide, we, we need to uh, work in every way we can at every level to tell the truth about the genocide and uh, to find, I think, pr primarily to the greatest extent possible through the voices of survivors. Uh, and, and then, uh, but, but uh, organizations like Remembering Srebrenica Post Conflict Research Center and and, and Bagi, Bosnia American Genocide Institute, is these community outreach organizations uh, do their part to try to spread the truth and uh, resist denial. Uh, so I think when the, the question, you know, so how do we ensure that the, ge the genocide is not repeated? Uh, the, we, as we understand it, den the denial is the clearest indicator that the atrocities could be repeated. And uh, laws in the European Union against genocide denial see genocide denial as, as a form of hate speech that can incite further violence. So we have to resist, resist denial by telling the truth as effectively as possible from uh, the, the voices of, of survivors for uh, speaking for those who can no longer speak. I'm thinking of a, a book that was published recently by uh, and Petrilla and Hassan Hassanovich called Voices from Srebrenica, which uh, does an amazing uh, job of telling the stories of Srebrenica survivors. Uh, and uh, that's what, I think that's an important contribution. Thank you um, all so much for your um, great inputs. Um, with Tatiana and how she mentioned the education, we just had a um, panel on genocide education, implementing educational classes within high schools as early as high school learning and um, universities um, where it's a ha more hands-on work where human rights advocacy is um, part of that genocide education as well. Um, and well, relating to Hassan Hassanovich's book, I will put that in the chat. Um, it is. Um, He's a great, um, he's a great guy, and the book is amazing. So, but that that is one book of many books and memoirs in the Bosnian community that share the stories of survivors. And my next question kind of relates to not only books but arts and kind of how can we use arts and like media as a form of remembrance and more like the film studies and kind of going off on the film Kovadi Shaida. How has a that film and other films on genocide cultivate this remembrance in our communities. Um, if we want, I why don't we start with whoever wants to go? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I love obviously what both of them uh, have already mentioned about the importance of education and the various different tools we have. Um, for example, remembering Srebrenica. We do educate directly in schools. We actually go into primary schools, which uh, for the Americans or the Bosnians is, you know, your sort of uh, elementary schools, 
we start at that very young age level and we try to relate it to, to kids in a very creative manner um, and obviously a very age sensitive manner to them about what actually happened in Bosnia, in Srebrenica, um, why it happened, what we can learn from it and obviously on the consequences of hatred. Um, we do work with secondary schools on university levels as well, which is excellent. But what you mentioned about art being this amazing tool, I mean, it really is. It's just phenomenal because it is one of those things that I think can really transcend kind of all the bounds. And I know that's such a cliche to say, but it does function very much like that. And we've seen that with obviously Cuvada Saida. It's had this phenomenal effect. I've had people, you know, find me on Twitter and just message, I never knew anything about the genocide, but I just watched the movie. Oh my God, you know, I want to learn more. Can you point me to the right direction? Can you, uh, you know, can I join an organization? Can I volunteer? Um, and it's people really from all over the world. Uh, last, for example, last year, we created a podcast. Um, it was called the Untold Killing Podcast. Um, and to date, we've had over 75,000 uh, listeners last time I checked, which was actually a couple months ago. Um, and people had a phenomenal response to that because it was a very creative way of us telling the story of the genocide in Srebrenica. But in particular, what was really impactful, it was survivors telling actually their own story through a media that they have never really had an opportunity. In fact, when we actually presented this um, to, you know, our sort of co-partner uh, organizations within Bosnia and Herzegovina or fellow activists that I knew of, and they were just like, oh, I don't know anybody in Bosnia that listens to podcasts. And I was like, well, that's fine because everybody in Bosnia knows what happened, but, you know, people in the United Kingdom and the United States may not. So it provides this amazing opportunity. Then you have things like we did a virtual exhibition uh, in the Srebrenica, you know, Memorial Center last July. Uh, they did uh, Safet Seitz's paintings, which was so, I mean, they were harrowing. They really kind of hit you in the face and they make you sit with the pain of the atrocity and the scale of that atrocity in a very human a uh, very emotional manner. Uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's really important that we talk about genocide and we talk about the ethnic cleansing, we talk about the concentration camps, the rape camps, the, you know, the bombing, all of that. And we can talk about all of those things in a very, I think, um, objective manner from a historical perspective, um, from a scholarly perspective. And I know that many people do that excellently. That's not, however, going to always draw in, I think, as many people as this sort of creative way will with, you know, the film Cuba de Saida, with a creative book, uh, with a book of poems. I've seen, you know, younger generations really get into that and talk about, you know, the pain of losing their parent or parents or family members into genocide. Um, and I think ultimately, if there are survivors involved, what it really allows them to do is to utilize art as a a form of therapy. Um, it's a way to turn their pain into power. Uh, and it's, I think, a greatly missed opportunity, you know. And again, we've seen the Cuvados Aida effect. There is almost no, uh, I think, no media that has not covered the film. Uh, we're talking about the New York Times. We're talking about some of the highest, you know, published and, and uh, read uh, newspapers and televisions. It's been nominated for an Oscar. Huge. It's been nominated for BAFTAs. I mean, it's just it's something that can that is watched by millions of people, that's followed by millions of people. And you get in there and you're like, yes, this is a movie. Yes, this is an experience. But this was also real. This happened. Um, and art, you know, may not always function that way, but it does when you connect it to something that is as real as the genocide. So I've always been very sort of encouraging of younger Bosnians in particular, but even, you know, non-Bosnians who just have, uh, I think, 
uh, an inclination to help or to raise awareness to really get in there with that sort of creative uh, outlet. Uh, we've had in, in Scotland here, we have an amazing painter who was actually a forensic scientist in Bosnia. He worked on uncovering the mass graves and it affected him so badly, the stories that he heard, the things that he saw that, you know, when he retired, he decided to uh, again, turn that trauma into something powerful and make these beautiful portraits um, that really tell the stories of survivors. So art has a huge place. And again, I think kind of connecting it back to like education and obviously social media. We're going to see a lot more of this. We're going to, I think, you know, Cuba de Saida is really going to, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful at least, it's going to open doors to tell more stories in a more creative manner. Sorry, that was a long rant, but I'm very passionate about this. Oh, thank you so much. And I really um, resonate with the humanizing part that art um, kind of gives us and it gives it um, sort of way to share our empathy. And also, um, Anessa is an author of Letters from Diaspora. So when you were talking about poems, it's a beautiful book that um, shows um, that shows that it has that poetry and gives those stories. Um, and I recommend everyone to um, read that as well. Um, but continuing on, um, kind of on that sort of spectrum of remembrance and kind of reconciliation, I know the Post Conflict Research Center posts the Balkan discourse, and um, kind of, um, they have those stories about um, everyday uh, people within the Balkans inside this um, city. And kind of that's a way I think of it as an art form as well as a storytelling. Storytelling is a great way of um, showcasing. Um, real voices and real people. So what um, kind of to Tatiana now, how um, does Post-Conflict Research, Research Center use the art and use um, talk kind of from remembrance to reconciliation in a way and promotes that efforts of peace as well? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, no, yeah, I mean, we've been, um, as I've kind of kind of said, we were working for a bit, yeah, you know, over ten years now. Um, and and um, when we started doing this work, as I said, there's been a lot of um, other colleagues who, and and organizations doing it, and and it's been you know it, it's been twenty five years since genocide happened, since the war started, since the war ended, and people get a little bit sick of constantly talking about this and pushing uh, these very heavy topics in, in, in the air. Um, and then we, we decided to use uh, creative multimedia and storytelling um, in producing um, documentary movies. We produce around 15 now, I think, and uh, including some 13, I believe, um, photography exhibitions as well. Um, that all present um, personal stories and narratives of victims and survivors of, including the Bosnian war, yes, but also um, more globally, um, other genocides and conflicts that have happened around the world. So we present them alongside the Bosnian, the stories of the Bosnian conflict, um, which proved very well in, in all our um, activities throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina and then a bit larger in the Western Balkans, because it allows people to connect with the stories in a different way. Um, and especially it allows them to put uh, the story of the Western Balkans in a different perspective, um, you know, seeing stories from Colombia alongside stories of, from Bosnia and Rwanda, which was a genocide that happened basically in a very similar timeline as the Bosnian one, um, allows people to connect with this differently and also allows them to kind of um, maybe understand the, 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 the legacy of the conflict for us a little bit better, knowing, you know, the Colombian conflict that lasted for 60 years and how they're dealing with this now and where we are and compare all this. Um, and just engage with with these this type of um, material in a, in a in a different way, um, and maybe not in in such a, a heavy way where we are um, talking about just numbers that might be very politicized and 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 all this. Um, when it comes to when it comes to using movies, and I do have to say when it comes to uh, Yasmila's latest movie, Koad Saida comes in a, in a very uh, specific time, but her uh, some of her previous movies, including the movie Grbavica, uh, which depicted a, a different, 
the different type of stories of, of, of women of, who, who survived sexual violence and conflict um, also came in a monumental time and, and led to, to, to great change um, in, 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 the, in this area and, and depicting stories of those type of women and bringing the survivor stories um, up, to the, up to the floor, you know, the amazing courage of, of women uh, of Forcha um, who testified in, in front of the ICTY and basically changed the international law in a way. Um, and and we, we were helping to, to bring those stories together and that, you know, we, we also, PCRC also worked with Abigail Disney on another film uh, of, for PBS that, that presents these type of stories of women of Forcha. So, there is definitely and always is is as an educational component and and bringing these type of stories um first and foremost to to to, to our bosnian youth um and then to a global public but there's they, they can also be used as a momentum to promote um these issues the kova de saida movie um the latest i mean honestly the the, the latest uh, commemoration in srebrenica that happened last year um, was even with the COVID restrictions uh, a, a great success if we can if we can uh, categorize it like that. Um, we had a, a luck and a privilege, and I'm really sorry that Mr. Suljakic is not here um, to work with the Serbian Genocide Memorial uh, to implement several art projects there. Um, our most recent project is called Mementos. It's an oral history project and, and also photography exhibition um, that uses objects uh, which are kind of always maybe not always think of, but uses objects of um, that were donated by victims' families or that were, find, that were found um, at the death march route. So that was the route, if people are not aware of it, that was the route that a lot of Bosniak men uh, use or try to use through the forest around Srebrenica to escape uh, the executions. Um, and so we, we went there together with the Serbians Memorial team. We found some of those objects and some of them were already donated uh, to the Serbians Memorial Center. And then through the objects, we told the stories of the families that donated them. And we told the stories of the people um, who, who, who the objects belong to and who are no longer with us and who were killed during the genocide. And it was a it was a, a, a special moment. It was also the 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 first time we we do an exhibition that's a photography exhibition, but has also voices. So it had like audio and 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 it's still it's now right now in the Serbian it's a memorial center and it will stay there as a permanent exhibition for people to connect with with these stories. And then on another hand, um, we we brought the the old famous uh, monument Shotenema uh, to to Srebrenica last year as well, um, which is a very, um, which is a very special anniversary for, even for that monument after over 15 years of traveling all around the world, this being seen by Bosnia and diaspora. Um, we brought, you know, as, as restrictions permitted, some 30 young people to Srebrenica, who together with the artist Ada Shehovic worked basically 12 hours during the whole day um, to pour uh, coffee cups, over 8,000 coffee cups. In remembrance of of the of the of the victims, so art can also have this interact interactive uh, uh, element, and we always like to try and do these type of uh, art performances, if you if you say so, with both uh, victims and survivors, as it was included last year, but also with young people, because it gives them a special um, it gives them a, in a way a privilege, but it also gives them a special feeling um, to remember and commemorate. Um, these innocent victims through doing something as simple as is pouring a coffee cup, um, laying it on the ground and, 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 and leaving that coffee cup there for 24 hours, basically, while the coffee evaporates because the people um, who, who the coffee was meant to can, cannot drink it anymore. So there are different, there, there are several elements in, in, in using art. We've seen um, truly always great reactions. Um, we, we, some of these projects, we've taken them all around Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and, and especially the photography exhibitions and movies that we created um, that talk about stories of, of women of sexual, who survived sexual violence and conflict. Um, we took them in, in you know, the, the, the parts of the country that you may not imagine that they are as accepted, including Republika Srpska entity. Um, and it, it's a, it's a, valuable work and 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 um, prove very effective for us because people do want to connect with these stories of course when they're given a safe space to 
to discuss them and, and, and acknowledge them and accept them. Well, if I, there, there's not much I can add uh, to this uh, excellent exposition. Uh, I, I could mention that I'm, I try to use film in my uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies class, and uh, uh, the students respond. You know, I think especially to, to the to the film. One one film that I found that was uh, helpful, although the, one of the, the one of the things I was going to say is that uh, it seems like each film tells a very specific story. Uh, I had the opportunity to be invited to write an article about films about the Bosnian genocide. And uh, so I set myself the task of finding, finding every film and seeing every film. Uh, and uh, so, so I think that that's just a, the, uh, the, the nature of, of art that there, each, each thing is representing perhaps the singularity of the suffering of a particular part of the genocide. So welcome to Sarajevo, for example, the film about the siege of Sarajevo. I, f I find the students respond to because it's, it's about journalism, the role of journalism in uh, telling the story, and uh, it has uh, archival footage from Chernobyl concentration camp, as well as from the siege of Sarajevo. And uh, sometimes after that film, the students will look at me and say, Professor, you know, why didn't we know about this? Uh, they respond and say, why, why didn't anyone tell us about this before? And I also explain it's a true story based on a true story uh, that and, and, and at one visit of mine to the Sarajevo Film Festival, I met some of the children who were uh, who were depicted in, in that film, uh, children from an orphanage who evacuated to Italy and they came back for a documentary. Uh, but I was going to also follow up on one thing that uh, Tatiana said uh, that when I was when I was writing this article, uh, I, I wrote about one of the films that touched me the most deeply, and that was uh, also Yasmila's film, uh, Grabavica, and it ha has a, a longer name. I, I remember seeing this film uh, during the uh, Sarajevo Film Festival. I don't remember when it was, but it was this amazing public screening in a supermarket parking lot, you know, that the community could just attend and sit in the parking lot, and uh, it was, a, Exceptional. So there, there's a way that films, and I'm glad that uh, Arnesa mentioned Untold Killing, which is an, an amazing, uh, just amazing uh, documentary of what happened through the medium of, of it's like it's like listening to the radio for me. Uh, it's like uh, the the virtues of listening to the radio. And I also use my own uh, documentary film that I made with my son in 2007 called The Geography of Genocide in Bosnia, re redeeming the earth in, in my classes and the students uh, respond. But this was, I, I, I was working with a, uh, uh, a high school student in Hartford who is the son of a Srebrenica survivor, uh, Bekir Hojic. And th I think this is, we're putting together a, a list of films for teachers in Connecticut to use. And I think there's a very rich list of films. It would be interesting to follow up and just put together that list so that uh, educators would have access to it. Thank you, Dr. Pettigrew. I was actually going to um, kind of lead into um, that co um, conversation as well and how can communities like Connecticut um, help um, remember and prevent future genocides. And I think the Bosnian American Genocide Institute is more based into um, here and how can we make those efforts to create solidarity between other communities and um, sort of promote that awareness and um, especially within our um, schools, um, our neighborhoods um, as well in Connecticut. I'm from Hartford as well. So there is a big community here of Bosnian um, Americans, especially from the Podrina area. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you, or, let me just continue on that that point for a moment. Well, I I, I think it's a it's it's a good a good thing to talk about because there on the one hand we talked about the importance of uh, survivors telling the truth about what happened, but it's also important for allies and organizations to try to support survivors. Uh, 
So, for, so Bosnian American Genocide Institute has worked hard to try to uh, sponsor programs, uh, partnering with the Illinois Holocaust Museum to uh, showcase books by survivors and also, uh, well, in the past, they would go to the museum in, in Skokie, which is uh, is an imp important resource and now and now in uh, you know online, uh, and uh, we we recently hosted a, a program with voices from Srebrenica at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. That is to say, Boggy. Uh, but we have a group of uh, dynamic volunteers. Uh, so I'm just thinking of what can what can what can people do? What can young people do? And we we have a group of dynamic young volunteers who are strategizing to support the work of Bakira Hasesic in Visegrad. And uh, we're particularly focused on protesting you know, the existence and legacy of the Vilina Vlas Hotel, where uh, instances of sexual violence took place. And I guess we don't have time to go into the details, but it's cur currently operating as a, uh, as a hotel and spa and gathering place. So uh, I'm just working with these uh, young volunteers and I'm very, you know, I'm inspired inspired by them and also inspired by uh, Baker Hojic, who I met through actually through the a Connecticut based organization hero is the Holocaust education resource outreach uh, in. Uh, hmm, Hartford West Hartford area West Hartford area so that that's that's important i've been trying to work with. Uh, with with teachers and doing workshops about the Bosnian genocide with. Uh, high school teachers and middle school teachers in Connecticut. I think that's this was, there's like so many layers on which you know the, the state passed this law to require Holocaust and genocide education in the public schools in 2018, and they 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 just said, here now now you have to do it. We have no funding. Go, and so we uh, working working with uh, the Connecticut Advisory Committee with the Department of Education under the auspices of this Hero organization. To try to help teachers, uh, to give teachers the resources to begin to talk about the Bosnian genocide in in classes. So that that's that's important. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Really related to kind of our sort of setting here at the University of Connecticut um, and just the population here as well. Um, and I guess the next question I want to ask kind of relates to all of our talks about how we kind of did see. Um, the success in Kovadi Shaida and like, the great things that come out of like arts and film, but there has also been a lot of backlash um, when it comes to that film as well with um, genocide deniers. Um, it may have been um, a sort of spur and I think this whole year has been a heightened level of hate speech and just hate on uh, social media and sort of giving a platform to um, genocide deniers and um, in our previous event, um, Dr. Stanton, who is also joining us um, at, on this event right now, <laughs> um, talked about how we have to change terminology and how ethnic cleansing is a word that's used so often to as genocide denial. So my question to um, all of you is how do we combat genocide deniers and how do you combat genocide deniers as well? I think everyone sort of made the point, obviously, of the importance of, you know, genocide education. Um, I think, obviously, that is going to be our go to tool. But um, I think for the sake of just sheer honesty, there are always going to be, unfortunately, uh, people who choose hate, uh, people who want to believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, people who hate the other uh, or have sort of an inclination towards, you know, racism or ethno-nationalism or uh, want to, you know, make themselves feel better by denying uh, horrible acts. Um, and I think that is what it really comes down to. Um, we are not ever going to be able to completely eradicate denialism. And we can see that with the Holocaust. Uh, you know, it's been 75 years uh, since the Holocaust, 76 actually years since the Holocaust. We have had, you know, thousands of survivors openly share their stories. We have had photo and video evidence. We have had, uh, you know, Mein Kampf, which, 
you know, talks about, obviously, uh, you know, the hatred of the Jewish people. Um, and just like with the Bosnian genocide, we have Mladic uh, and Karadzic and uh, Joko, uh, for example, you know, saying things like this is genocide or the infamous call uh, between, I believe it's uh, Karadzic and, and Joko, where he says, you know, um, if basically the Muslims don't back down, 300,000 Muslims in Sarajevo will be murdered. You know, they were very open. We have it on video. We have the forensic evidence. We have all of that thing. So I think the main thing is to understand there will always be these people. We are never going to be able to reach everyone, but that doesn't mean that we don't try. That doesn't mean that we stop discussing it. Um, I obviously, uh, you know, I do the social media for remembering Srebrenica often and, you know, review some of our things and I'll, uh, you know, I'll go in and we'll have a innocuous post, uh, maybe sometimes not even related to the genocide, but just to the impact or the consequences of hatred and it will have deniers respond to it. Um, and then in just my own experience, you know, I'll talk about what happened to me in Sarajevo. I'll talk about what happened to my family in Visegrad or um, the fact that I have a family member buried, you know, in Potocari. Uh, and people will be, no, it didn't happen. Well, of course it did. I'm here. My family's here. There's, you know, dozens of people, hundreds, thousands, really, who can back me up and share this. But uh, to those people, that doesn't matter. My story doesn't matter. I mean, Sulagic's story doesn't matter. It's fake. It's fake news. Kuvada Saida is just a propaganda film. The genocide never happened. I think it's really, really important for people to take a step back and to to realize that there is no difference of opinion. There is either it happened or it did not. And we can choose to either waste our energy on arguing with deniers or choose to amplify survivor stories and amplify media um, photographs, evidence, ICTY judgments, books, movies, whatever it may be, that will reach, you know, thousands or millions of other people, which will hopefully start to drown out the voices of those deniers. So yeah, I think, you know, it is education and it is a lot of, it requires a lot of support, I think, from um, other people. Uh, from people who are not Bosnian or from, you know, our allies, uh, whether they're American or, you know, uh, British or uh, even Serbian, because you have, for example, you know, the women in black in Serbia, you have the uh, youth human rights uh, organization in Serbia as well. And they're very loudly outspoken about the fact that the genocide did happen um, and that, you know, the government of Serbia does need to obviously take some um responsibility and accountability and really put an end to the denialism so i think we also have to lean on those kinds of people um and then just to sort of finish it off uh i think in addition to all of that there also has to be under an understanding of the absolute gravity of denialism uh which is that when we poke these holes when we give into conspiratorial thinking, when we, uh, you know, deny out of hatred or ignorance or whatever it may be. What we're really doing is paving a way for another genocide to occur. Uh, we have seen not just this past year, but we have seen an influx in right wing nationalist violence against Muslims, uh, against black and brown people, against Jewish people, we have seen mosques being attacked, churches being attacked, uh, synagogues being attacked. We've seen, you know, people stopped on the street and spat at or hit at, whatever. All of those things, when we deny acts of hatred, um, such as, you know, the genocide in Bosnia, uh, that's what we're really doing. We're giving this green light to people who are just waiting, they're just waiting for that opportunity to come in and further spread their hate, um, spew their, you know, denialism, 
Um, and that really, that doesn't just hurt me. Obviously, it hurts me on a personal level. It hurts the mothers of Srebrenica. It hurts the people of Bosnia. But it's also going to hurt all of us um, because we're, we're not being strong enough to stand up to it and to say, no, actually, you're wrong. This happened and nothing you say is going to make me change that fact because I've seen the videos. I've seen the pictures. I've spoken to survivors. Um, so it does come down to, I think, the basic <laughs> humanity uh, in in us and us doing our best to really protect that on a personal level um, and also on a systemic level. So I'll leave this to, to David because he does speak about it uh, often, writes about it so often and advocates for it in such an amazing, phenomenal way. But yes, obviously, I think genocide denialism laws uh, need to you know be enacted and i think hate speech laws in general across the board really have to be made stronger as well so i know that was long ago I yield my time <laughs> well, tatiana do you want to respond yeah since we're kind of going in that that circle um thank you um yeah i mean when it when it comes to you know someone who was born and brought up in Bosnia and has been working here um, for, for close to 15 years now. Um, we, we really have to yeah, start from the, from, from, from the beginning in, in Bosnia for, first when it comes to um, the absence of laws, um, the, the um, law uh, on, on, on combating and preventing genocide denial has been something in the, in the works for years now. Um, and we still don't don't have it um, as as a national law. Certain yeah, entities do, but but not as a national law. It really it is. I don't want to say it's a start because that seems like nothing else should be done before it happens. But many things have been done. Uh, but it's definitely a, a a very much needed step to move us forward um, in this, and not just that law, but we also had. You know, there were these great documents created. There's a whole, there was a whole strategy for transitional justice in Bosnia. There was a, 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 a there, there are also strategies for um, prosecution of war crimes, and and there's a lot of lacking in their adoption and then in their in their implementation. Um, so so the legal framework is is definitely something that's that's pushing us us back um, in in different ways, and then also is pushing back the the work that civil society organizations do. Because we on the ground on the ground can do as much. Uh, but when it comes to education, um, our reach will always be limited until these type of topics um, are discussed in schools. Um, what our our center has been has been trying to do, and and we're now actually working with several other civil society organizations is is creating sort of a toolkit. Um, for um, peace education uh, that will that won't necessarily uh, depict as many historical facts uh, 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 from from the last war, but it will introduce these type of topics and this type of thinking. Um, and our hope is once this toolkit is done, and we're working with a great actually group of of history teachers. Um, and educators from across uh, Bosnia and across the entities um, is to bring it into schools um, and, and to start uh, kind of on, on the small doors, but start start knocking and 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 bringing these type of topics in schools. Because one of the very also um, uh, important things to note is is that as, as complicated as Bosnian system is with entities and cantons and a bunch of ministries, we still don't have a state ministry of education. So um, any type of change uh, to, to happen in our curriculums to, to start bringing these topics more and more um, on, on, on the level to, to our youth is, is very difficult because there's a lot of different ministries, a lot of different offices. Uh, the whole procedure is incredibly complicated. And so that those are kind of the first two, two ways to, to fight this. And civil society organizations have taken so far the biggest kind of leap um, in, in educating people on, on what has happened, we have also recently, um, uh, again, our work with the Serbian and Genocide Memorial Center, um, where we uh, took all these, all the judgments uh, related to Serbian and Genocide on, on all different levels. So starting from the ICTY and then the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, then also some of the courts in Belgrade. Um, and because uh, because they're very heavy, they're very big judgments. Um, they're all online and available, but to read them, even me as a lawyer, 
uh, takes time and, and, and focus. So we took them and we created um, a, a photo exhibition and we created also kind of a social media campaign um, that puts kind of upfront uh, individuals and people responsible and people who um, have been perse persecuted and sentenced uh, for Severinica genocide in, in, in The Hague and, and, and in Bosnia as well. And um, what that also creates and how, why that helps us work a lot is that we um, don't put the, the, the blame of the Srebrenica genocide on, on, grew, on, on groups or nations. We put it on individuals, we put it on, on, on specific armies, uh, we put it on people who were sentenced and prosecuted for this. Um, and it also helps, again, um, uh, young people especially understand this um, and, and deal and understand these facts that, that, that are ha that, that are in front of them because they're very tough sometimes to understand or what has even happened or or who are the people responsible for this except yes the, the main people that we know all about but the Serbian genocide did not did not happen just because of one man it happened because of a system um, and it happened and it started a long way before 995 um and and it uh, in, in some ways and i know you you had professor stanton there um has continued in in different forms up until today um uh, it, it it continues with the nihilism it continues even with the I think yeah the 11th step that i think uh, one of our also bosnian diaspora scholars um has been has been promoting professor Haris Khalilovic with triumphalism with with celebrating what has happened but that's why we need to bring back we bring kind of people back to to the facts to the faces um and 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 people responsible and then maybe uh, cuz you were when when you when uh, David was talking previously you about academia and people i i had a um in mind um project that PCRC has been doing for several years now that might be interesting for you for you guys and it's kind of interesting to, for this whole topic um, is a big research project we've been doing with King's College London and University of London uh, it's called Art, Art and Reconciliation and um, the, the, the lovely team especially from King's College London took upon themselves to, to research the role of arts um, in, in reconciliation and uh, took some of our projects as well and evaluated them. But it's been, it's a project that's been kind of ongoing since 2017, I believe, um, and, and, and it's still happening. And why I mention academia in this as well is because me now being a member of, of, of it and, and, and doing, dabbling a little bit in that, I've also seen a lot of um, kind of efforts on, on, the, on the side of academia to put to, to find ways to just kind of settle. And I've heard this from even, unfortunately, some of my professors. You know, it's been 25, 30 years. Um, maybe it's okay to call something a different name if that means it'll just settle uh, the passions and people just need to at some point move on. Um, and so I think working with the academia and, and through, with PCRC, we've been, we've been working with international researchers from all, all around. Um, for many, many years, and like hundreds of them went through our center. Um, it's also an important outlet because that's kind of how um, a, a lot of these these stories and truths uh, go toward the world. And so um, maybe uh, Edna, to your question, what Connecticut can do or or any other academic institution as well um, is to to not settle um, and 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 keep going and keep researching. Um, the, these topics and keep putting them in in, in focus because it means a lot to 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 all of us working on the ground. And I know, you know, when we were approached by King's College and their war studies department, it meant a lot um, to to get this research done. And, and and it's continuing, yeah, now over 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 five years. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And I can share the link of the of the project as well if if you guys are interested. Uh, is there time for me to respond briefly to that? Yes, there is. Oh, okay. Well, th <laughs> well thanks. But thanks very much to Ernesta and Tatiana for their thoughtful uh, reflections. I guess all, all I would say is that uh, uh, that uh, there's a uh, resisting genocide denial is a protracted struggle uh, because it, it exists in so many ways and layers. Uh, you know, recently, in the last week, 
this international commission that had been appointed by the Assembly of Republika Srpska published a, a report. It's available in English. Uh, it's almost 1,500 pages called the, 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 the suffering, basically a paraphrasing, the suffering of the Serbs in Sarajevo from 1992 to 1995. So it's a complete revisionist, uh, you know, uh, account of what happened. And they took their time to develop a critique of the Ottoman Empire and also the role of radical Islam. So it's, it's kind of re revisionism, revisionism on steroids and it's in under the sort of academic eyes of, of, uh, of the academics who were involved in presenting it. And at the same time, uh, there, there are these, you know, posters and statues and memorials uh, springing up all the time. A new one honoring Ratko Mladic appeared in, in, in Focha uh, within, within days. But when, when I was talking to the high representative in, in February, he was explaining that he had been waiting to condemn uh, the, uh, the plaque for heritage on the dormitory in Pala until there was a second instance verdict in, 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 or the final, final verdict. And uh, so, no, so now that there's been the final verdict in the, in the Karadich case, he, he felt empowered to demand that it be removed. But the, the problem is, is, is that while he was waiting, right, for the second instance verdict, of course, there's been a proliferation of these uh, statues and memorials. And I was just going to make the point that some of them, uh, some of them have these sort of vague references that they're glorifying and hero, heroizing, you could say that, uh, the defenders of Republika Srpska, the fighters of Republika Srpska, whose bodies laid the foundation of Republika Srpska, and uh, heroes of the homeland, the homeland, patriotic homeland war. Uh, and, all, and none of those memorials would be subject to this, this uh, criteria that the high representative has decided to use, because there will be no second instance verdicts in the case of these sort of vague references. Uh, last example would be that there was a memorial in Visegrad on April 12th. It's an official memorial on the Visegrad uh, website to to honor the Russian soldiers, the, the volunteers who, who died defending Visegrad. Uh, and, you, you know, there was a, a Russian cross installed, in, and I think in 2017, on the hill above Visegrad. So it's sort of everywhere you everywhere you look. As I, as I say, the, these uh, memorials are colonizing the cultural domain. So this entire generation of uh, children is growing up thinking that there was no genocide, it was a defense, it was a patriotic undertaking. And so it's not at all surprising that, that the young leadership of Republika Srpska, if I could call them that, or, but uh, in the, the mayor of Srebrenica, the, the mayor of uh, Banja Luka denied deny the genocide and reject the uh, rulings, the judgments of the international courts. Uh, and uh, as if Amir was here, he, he, he could tell us that, you know, in, in last July 11th, a poster went up in Srebrenica with a picture of Vladic declaring that July 11th was Srebrenica Liberation Day. And uh, this, so this, this is what survivors are facing. I think it's really uh, in, uh, in legal terms, it's 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 criminal. It should be criminalized and prohibited in Bosnia. And hope, hopefully, the high representative will follow through on his promise to pass such laws. Thank you all so much for answering. Um, it's definitely something I've been um, trying to battle myself and trying to find ways on successfully um, combating genocide denial, and then also. Um, I, it's getting late, so I don't want to hold you all <laughs> anymore, but I'm just going to leave it off on like, I do hope that from this discussion, especially after a whole day filled with kind of um, law jargon and political um, uh, aspects of genocide, we kind of humanize the uh, thing. And as we mentioned, our genocide education that we shouldn't just look at it as a statistic or as a number, because once we do, we kind of forget what how to combat it and how to prevent it in the future. Um, so thank you all for joining me today and making such a great effort and talking about such important things, especially when it comes to Srebrenica, said that it's still very close and dear um, and in all of our, in many survivors and in many people who are affected one way or another. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for hosting us. Thank you. <laughs>